Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Willis, and you will love economics. When the aggregate economy experiences fluctuations, but fails to return to full employment through natural market adjustments, government can implement fiscal policy to help stabilize the economy. Through spending and tax policy, government's goal is to either stimulate or reduce aggregate demand by changing consumer spending and government expenditures. However, the Federal Reserve has a role to play too. The Fed can use several monetary policy tools to manipulate the money supply and therefore influence interest rates which will directly impact investment spending by firms and will affect aggregate demand and real GDP output. In this video, we'll focus on the Federal Reserve and how it manages the money supply and influences interest rates through monetary policy. Monetary policy is defined as the direct actions of the Federal Reserve that are intended to influence aggregate demand and change economic conditions. These actions are implemented through changes in the supply of M1 M2 and M3 money in the economy, which in turn affects interest rates and investment spending by firms. Because investment spending is a component of aggregate demand, changing the money supply and interest rates will directly affect aggregate demand and can help close GDP gaps when they exist. According to Keynesian economists, the use of monetary policy is necessary when the aggregate economy is experiencing excessive inflation or economic contraction and the free market fails to correct itself. Without intervention, the economy will spiral out of control and economic conditions will worsen. Using policy correctly can stabilize aggregate demand and return the economy to equilibrium. With monetary policy, that starts with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the central banking system of the United States. Its primary goal is to monitor the financial health of the aggregate economy and help maintain ideal economic conditions through monetary policy. The Federal Reserve is comprised of three parts. The first is the Board of Governors, which is the governing body of the Fed. The Board is comprised of seven members who serve a single 14-year term. Each member must be nominated by the President and then confirmed by the Senate. The Board of Governors is led by the Federal Chairperson, who serves a four-year term once they are nominated to the position by the President and confirmed by the Senate. The Chair must already be a member of the Board of Governors and can serve more than one term. The second part of the Federal Reserve System is the Open Market Committee. This committee is made up of 12 voting members, including the seven members of the Board of Governors. The third part of the Federal Reserve System are the 12 Regional Reserve Banks. These banks are stationed around the country and serve as conduits through which the Federal Reserve can communicate and interact with private sector banks and financial institutions. They distribute funds, inspect the health of banks and their districts, and hold funds for private sector banks. The Federal Reserve has four monetary policy options at its disposal to help stabilize the economy, the discount rate, the reserve requirement, open market operations, and the federal funds rate. The discount rate is the interest rate that the Federal Reserve charges commercial banks to borrow money directly from the Treasury. When the discount rate changes, it makes borrowing money more or less expensive for commercial banks. When the discount rate is low, banks borrow more, injecting more money into the economy. When the discount rate is high, banks borrow less, taking money out of the economy. The Board of Governors makes all decisions regarding lending between the Federal Reserve and banks and financial institutions, and so is in charge of setting the discount rate. The reserve requirement, also known as the reserve ratio, is the portion or percentage of all new demand deposits that banks must hold in reserves and cannot lend. When a deposit is made at a bank, the bank is required to hold a percentage of that deposit in its vaults and is not allowed to lend it out or use it in any way. When the reserve ratio changes, it changes the amount of new money made available by banks, which makes borrowing money more or less expensive for firms. When the reserve ratio is low, banks inject more money into the economy, increasing the money supply. When the reserve ratio is high, banks inject less money into the economy, decreasing the money supply. Because the reserve ratio impacts the volume of loanable funds available in the banking system, the Board of Governors is in charge of setting the reserve ratio. Open market operations are the transactions between the Federal Reserve and investors, where Treasury bonds and other securities are bought and sold. When the Fed buys bonds, 
It hands over new money to investors in exchange for their assets. This injects new money into the economy, which causes the money supply to increase. When the Fed sells bonds, investors hand over their money to the Fed in exchange for a bond. This takes money out of the economy, which causes the money supply to decrease. The Open Market Committee debates and decides on the buying and selling of bonds and securities in the open market, and so is in charge of open market operations. The federal funds rate is the interest rate at which commercial banks and depository institutions borrow money directly from each other. When the federal funds rate changes, it makes borrowing money more or less expensive for commercial banks. When the federal funds rate is low, banks borrow more, injecting more money into the economy. When the federal funds rate is high, banks borrow less, taking money out of the economy. The federal funds rate is altered most directly through open market operations, and so the open market committee is in charge of setting the federal funds rate. There are two types of monetary policy. The first is expansionary monetary policy. This type of policy is also known as easy monetary policy. Expansionary monetary policy is appropriate when the economy is in a recessionary gap and real GDP output is being produced at too slow a rate, causing excessive unemployment. The Federal Reserve has four policy options to stabilize the economy and stimulate aggregate demand. Decrease the discount rate, decrease the reserve ratio, purchase bonds in the open market, or decrease the federal funds rate. Decreasing the discount rate makes lending from the Treasury less expensive for banks, which means banks borrow greater sums from the Fed. For example, if the Fed lowers the discount rate from 5 to 2 percent, then banks will pay 3 percent less in interest on every dollar they borrow from the Federal Reserve. This means that they will pay less back to the Fed over the life of their loans, allowing them to keep more of the interest they charge us when we borrow from them meaning they can earn greater profits on every loan they issue. As the banks borrow more money at a lower discount rate, the money supply increases, leading to a decrease in the nominal interest rate in the money market. This acts as a catalyst for greater investment spending in the aggregate economy. This increase in investment spending will cause an increase in aggregate demand, which will cause real GDP growth and return the economy to full employment. Decreasing the reserve ratio means banks can now lend out more of the reserves they have on hand in their vaults, as well as a greater percentage of every demand deposit that comes through their doors. For example, if the Fed set the reserve ratio at 20%, then banks would be required to hold 20% of every demand deposit made by consumers. That means they can lend 80 cents of every dollar to firms and consumers in the form of new loans, but they must hold 20 cents of every dollar in reserve and cannot lend it out. If the Board of Governors decreases the reserve ratio to 10%, banks could immediately release a portion of the reserves that they are currently holding and, in addition, can now lend out 90 cents of every new dollar in demand deposits to firms and consumers. As banks lend out greater quantities of loanable funds, the money supply increases, leading to a decrease in the nominal interest rate in the money market. This acts as a catalyst for greater investment spending in the aggregate economy. This increase in investment spending will cause an increase in aggregate demand, which will cause real GDP growth and return the economy to full employment. Purchasing bonds on the open market means that the Federal Reserve is directly injecting more money into the economy by releasing funds from the Treasury and transferring those funds to investors. When the Open Market Committee decides that it's prudent to buy bonds on the open market, the Fed announces to any and all investors that it's willing to pay them for their treasury bonds or securities that they are currently holding. If investors don't want to wait until their bond becomes mature to collect their returns, they can sell to the Fed at this time and walk away with cash in hand. When the Fed buys a bond, it takes M1 money from the treasury and uses it to complete the purchase. When the M1 money was in the treasury, it was not included in the money supply because it wasn't held in M1 demand deposits, nor was it held in an M2 or M3 near money account. It was simply stored in the treasury and out of the economy. The very moment the M1 is handed to the investor to purchase the bond, it has been injected into the hands of a consumer and instantly becomes part of the money supply. This is the magic moment that the money supply has been increased by the Federal Reserve through open market operations. However, the process isn't done yet. The M1 cash handed over to the investor by the Federal Reserve will, one way or another, find its way back into banks in the form of demand deposits. This means banks have more money to lend out. 
As banks lend out greater quantities of loanable funds, the money supply increases, leading to a decrease in the nominal interest rate in the money market. This acts as a catalyst for greater investment spending in the aggregate economy. This increase in investment spending will cause an increase in aggregate demand, which will cause real GDP growth and return the economy to full employment. Decreasing the federal funds rate makes lending between banks less expensive, which means banks borrow greater sums from each other. The Fed commonly decreases the federal funds rate by injecting money into the economy through the buying of bonds in the open market. For example, if the Fed buys bonds and decreases the federal funds rate from 6 to 4%, then banks will pay 2% less on interest on every dollar that they borrow from each other. This means they will pay less back to each other over the life of their loans, allowing them to keep more of the interest they charge us when we borrow from them, meaning that they can earn greater profits on every loan that they issue. As banks borrow more money at a lower federal funds rate, the money supply increases, leading to a decrease in the nominal interest rate in the money market. This acts as a catalyst for greater investment spending in the aggregate economy. This increase in investment spending will cause an increase in aggregate demand, which will cause real GDP growth and return the economy to full employment. The second type of monetary policy is contractionary monetary policy. This type of policy is also known as tight monetary policy. Contractionary monetary policy is appropriate when the economy is in an inflationary gap and real GDP output is being produced at too fast a rate, causing excessive inflation. The Federal Reserve has four policy options to stabilize the economy and reduce aggregate demand. Increase the discount rate, increase the reserve ratio, sell bonds on the open market, or increase the federal funds rate. Increasing the discount rate makes lending from the Treasury more expensive for banks, which means banks borrow lesser sums from the Fed. For example, if the Fed raises the discount rate from 3 to 7%, then banks will pay 4% more in interest on every dollar that they borrow from the Federal Reserve. This means that they will pay back more to the Fed over the life of their loans, and they can't keep as much of the interest that they charge us when we borrow from them, meaning that they earn less profit on every loan they issue. As banks borrow less money at a higher discount rate, the money supply decreases, leading to an increase in the nominal interest rate in the money market. This will result in a reduction in investment spending in the aggregate economy. This decrease in investment spending will cause a decrease in aggregate demand, which will cause real GDP contraction and return the economy to full employment. Increasing the reserve ratio means banks can't lend out as much of the reserves they have on hand as they used to, and also, must hold on to a greater percentage of every new deposit that comes in their doors. For example, if the Fed set the reserve ratio at 25%, then banks would be required to hold 25% of every demand deposit made by consumers. That means they can lend 75 cents of every dollar to firms and consumers in the form of new loans, but they must hold 25 cents of every dollar in reserve and cannot lend it out. If the Board of Governors increases the reserve ratio to 50%, banks are immediately required to hold 50 cents of every dollar in new demand deposits and can only lend out 50 cents to firms and consumers. The lending capacity of banks everywhere is instantly cut in half. As banks lend out lesser quantities of loanable funds, the money supply decreases, leading to an increase in the nominal interest rate in the money market. This will result in a reduction in investment spending in the aggregate economy. This decrease in investment spending will cause a decrease in aggregate demand, which will cause real GDP contraction and return the economy to full employment. Selling bonds on the open market means that the Federal Reserve is directly withdrawing money from the economy and taking funds out of the hands of investors and transferring those funds to the Treasury. When the Open Market Committee decides it's appropriate to sell bonds on the open market, the Fed announces to any and all investors that it's willing to sell Treasury bonds and securities to anyone who is willing to invest their cash with the Fed. In essence, the Fed is asking to borrow money from investors and, in return, is pledging to pay them back the principal of the bond, plus any interest attached to the bond over time. Treasury bonds are actually great investments. They're safe, and they potentially have high yield. Investors who have disposable income and want to capitalize on this financial investment opportunity can buy bonds from the Fed at this time. When the Fed sells a bond, the investor liquefies an asset and hands the M1 money over to the Fed, who in turn takes the Treasury bond 
and gives it to the investor to complete the purchase. Because the M1 was taken out of banks and transferred to the Fed, it has been removed from the money supply because it is no longer in the form of M1, M2, or M3. Instead, it's in the treasury and out of the money supply. As bondholders liquefy assets and hand over M1 cash to the Federal Reserve during the open market operation, it drains the banking system of reserves. This means that banks have less money to lend out. As banks lend out lesser quantities of loanable funds, the money supply decreases, leading to an increase in the nominal interest rate in the money market. This will result in a reduction in investment spending in the aggregate economy. This decrease in investment spending will cause a decrease in aggregate demand, which will cause real GDP contraction and return the economy to full employment. Increasing the federal funds rate makes lending between banks more expensive, which means banks borrow lesser sums from each other. The Fed commonly increases the federal funds rate by taking money out of the economy through the selling of bonds in the open market. For example, if the Fed sells bonds and increases the federal funds rate from 5% to 8%, then banks will pay 3% more in interest on every dollar that they borrow from each other. This means that they will pay back more to each other over the life of their loans, and they can't keep as much of the interest that they charge us when we borrow from them, meaning that they will earn less profit on every loan that they issue. As banks borrow less money at a higher federal funds rate, the money supply decreases, leading to an increase in the nominal interest rate in the money market. This will result in a reduction in investment spending in the aggregate economy. This decrease in investment spending will decrease aggregate demand, which will cause real GDP contraction and return the economy to full employment. And that's Types of Monetary Policy. Be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red button below so you can receive alerts about new videos when they become available. If you enjoy the channel or find my videos useful, let me know by liking the video and feel free to leave a comment below. We have full video lectures on every topic in macro and microeconomics, as well as quick macro and micro minute videos for cram sessions and quick reviews. If you'd like to learn more, you can click here for my effects of monetary policy video or you can click here for my Macro Minute video on bond prices. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on You Will Love Economics.